Hello, my name is Steve Supan, and I work for the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, whose headquarters is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, this, uh, this talk that I'm giving uh, today is an expanded English language version of a talk that was given on November 22nd, 2021 for the Brazilian uh, Research Network on Nanotechnology, Society, and Environment otherwise known as Renanosoma. Uh, Renanosoma has kindly uh, hosted me at both uh, in-person and digital uh, meetings over the last uh, eight years. And um, during the last two years, I've given presentations on uh, nano-coated pesticides. Uh, today's presentation is partly derived from those that past work and um, we'll be talking about a new class of pesticides and a new mode of action. Uh, the mode of action refers to the way in which a pesticide uh, kills uh, or neutralizes uh, the target pest. So a quick overview of today's talk um, first. Um, so why um, are there nanotechnology enabled RNA interference pesticides, RNA interference uh, a molecule. And I'm going to formulate this in terms of three responses to uh, increasing herbicide resistant weeds, especially to the extremely widely used uh, herbicide glyphosate, uh, which is the active ingredient in uh, the Monsanto Roundup Ready product. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, gen the genetic engineering editing of uh, RNA molecules, uh, which is um, essential for developing uh, this new mode of action. Um, talk a little bit about what happens when the editing uh, results in unintended mutations of the interference RNA. Some uh, mutations are benign, some uh, pose significant health risks. I'm going to talk about uh, nanomaterial coatings for RNA pesticide delivery. Um, these nanomaterials are um, between an, an atomic and, and a molecular scale and uh, generally concern uh, nanoclays and nanobiopolymers. I'm going to discuss very briefly why do these uh, RNA interference pesticide developers dismiss these risks? i um, going to talk about some principles for properly risk assessing and regulating RNA interference pesticides. And then uh, I'm adding to the, uh, to the Brazilian or the Renanosoma lecture, a uh, kind of postscript on the uh, current state of the green light uh, bioscience RNA interference pesticide. Um, this um, this pesticide product has not been authorized for commercial use, but it is in the testing stage. So uh, there's kind of two perspectives, I think, on uh, new modes of action and pesticides. Uh, one is expressed here uh, in an essay called Weed Management in 2050 by the Weed, well, Weed Science Society of America. Quote, the future of chemical control depends on the discovery of herbicides with new uh, modes of action. And then uh, an optimistic outlook is that uh, these new modes of action will outsmart weed resistance uh, by the genetic engineering targeting of existing uh, natural RNA pathways in weeds and insect pests. Uh, a more um, skeptical uh, viewpoint is that um, this would be uh, this technology is to open a, a Pandora's box of technology fixes? Pandora's box being a, a mythical expression of of the evils of the world um, by unleashing new forms of weed and pest resistance and uh, environmental health and safety harms, including to to the humans applying uh, these uh, new pesticide products. So here we have um, a weed scientist uh, standing in a soybean field 
which is infested with uh, an herbicide resistant uh, weed that is almost as tall as the weed scientist and is choking the productivity of the soybean plants that are to the left of him. And uh, in the uh, in the clever title of this uh, uh, of this agricultural publication article, uh, breaking pra- breaking Pandora's box is um, basically how uh, the the growing number of weeds that are resisting uh, pesticide products um, is going to is the Pandora's box that. Uh, this new technology is going to break. Um, the increase in herbicide resistance generally, and, and, and more specifically regarding glyphosate, um, in this Brazilian research article is very much tied to the uh, introduction of uh, genetically engineered seeds uh, designed to, to, uh, uh, to resist uh, glyphosate. And here, uh, you can see the, the increasing use of uh, uh, transgenic uh, seeds in Brazil for soybean, now up to about 96% of all uh, soybean use. Um, and uh, in May is around 89%, cotton uh, about uh, 94%. And uh, up through, this is up through 2018, well, and here, uh, the, the weed scientists talk about a, a pre-glyphosate era and a post-glyphosate era. Um, and the, in, here, in the, again, in this Brazilian research article, the real takeoff in uh, glyphosate resistance uh, by these individual weed varieties that are le- you know, listed uh, to the right and to the left of this line that you know, emerges around 2005, um, uh, really is when you have a large increase in use, use of uh, uh, seeds genetically engineered to resist uh, glyphosate or more specifically round, uh, called, so-called Roundup Ready seeds. Uh, so here's the first response to uh, weed resistance to glyphosate, apply a yet more toxic pesticide. And um, as a result of this application, of uh, uh, a pesticide called Dicamba, uh, two um, plants that are genetically engineered to resist Dicamba's uh, toxic effects. You have the problem of uh, drift of Dicamba onto plants that are not genetically engineered to, uh, to resist it, including uh, all manner of horticulture plants, as well as uh, grains and oil seeds not uh, not engineered to resist uh, dicamba, and um, there are in the United States uh, millions of acres uh, that have been damaged by dicamba. There are uh, a uh, an increasing number of dicamba crop damage lawsuits, and here uh, in an advertisement to the right of this uh, farmer whose crops have been damaged. Um, you have an advertisement for uh, lawyers who are happy to litigate uh, cases uh, against uh, Monsanto, sometimes against their neighbors. So this is creating um, both an economic and a social problem. The second response to increasing um, weed resistance is to uh, coat with nanomaterials existing active ingredients uh, and so here you have uh, a situation where um, you're going to try to reduce um, the, the amount of active ingredient that is applied and um, hopefully reduce the, uh, the pace of increase in, uh, in weed resistance. And this pesticide delivery system here is depicted in this um, uh, drawing where you have the active ingredient to the left. You have the carrier material, again, generally some combination of, of nanoclays or nanobiopolymers, and this constitutes the pesticide delivery system. And this pesticide delivery system opens the nanomaterial coating 
in response to uh, a certain degree of precipitation, uh, pH in soil. Sometimes there's a temperature um, signal, so it's thermosensitive in this case. But the idea in general is to um, reduce both the amount of, of pesticide used and then hopefully uh, reduce the amount of uh, uh, pesticide resistance or herbicide resistance. The third response is the one that we're going to devote much, most time to today is um, uh, the creation of a, a nano-coated double-strand RNA interference molecule uh, as the new mode of action in a pesticide product. Here uh, it is announced in a science, this, this product is announced uh, in a scientific journal uh, by uh, a team of scientists from Greenlight Biosciences in the United States. It is a sprayable pesticide product that is targeted uh, to, uh, to kill Colorado potato beetles. And um, we're going to talk more about both the work of these scientists and also the, um, um, the kind of nano bio interface of this product. But first, a little uh, simplified kind of picture about what genetic engineering looks like ideally. Um, here, uh, we're talking about the editing of a DNA uh, a genomic sequence. Um, the, there, are, there are several uh, genetic engineering techniques, but uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is probably the most prevalent, the most widely used. And in this um, illustration, we have uh, the, CA, the CAS9 enzyme uh, cutting uh, through a uh, genetic uh, or genomic sequence. And, um, and then that sequence uh, is repaired uh, by a messenger RNA, which is guided by um, a library of genetic or genomic data. And, and this library uh, is uh, the result of a lot of research which attempts to um, coordinate um, certain genomic sequences with certain desirable traits um, that are hoped to be achieved through the genetic engineering. However, um, either because the, uh, the GE uh, editing technique is um, not well uh, carried out or because the genomic uh, library data is inaccurate, um, you do have uh, many cases in which um, the cut is in the wrong place and or uh, the repair has been done in the wrong place. And so the result of this is hundreds of unintended mutations or sometimes they're called off-target mutations because the on-target mutations are the ones which uh, the genetic engineers want to express uh, uh, you know, desired uh, traits in plants and, uh, and animals. So um, a couple of years ago, um, maybe just a year ago now, um, the Friends of the Earth uh, produced this report on RNA interference pesticide products called gene silencing pesticides, uh, because that's what the um, RNA interference engineering is often referred to. And the <clears throat> purpose of this um, uh, engineering technique is to interfere with the, with the protein expression that is vital uh, for pest survival. So, you know, from this same essay, we have a drawing that explains the mode of action in the active ingredient of this new kind of pesticide. And so we have uh, the our RNA interference molecule, uh, which functions to regulate uh, gene expression. Um, it blocks protein synthesis um, because proteins uh, are instructions for carrying out many uh, processes in, in, in an organism. Uh, you have this double-stranded uh, uh, RNA, uh, which is called otherwise known as interfering RNAs, and um, 
it's composed of nucleic acids and these nucleic acids are pro processed into smaller fragments. And then uh, the interfering RNA uh, and the target messenger RNA binds. So if you have a uh, sequence of RNA in a plant uh, or an insect that you are targeting uh, and the uh, and, and the, 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 the sequence of the interfering RNA and the messenger RNA overlap and bind, uh, what happens then is that the messenger RNA is cut in two and it is destroyed. Uh, no proteins are produced. Um, the interference in gene expression or, or gene silencing then results in the death of the targeted pest. Um, a number of products are being developed um, with variations of this uh, genetic engineering technique applied to natural RNA. Um, perhaps from a commercial viewpoint, maybe the most significant one is the spray that Bayer um, is developing to try to reverse uh, glyphosate resistance in weeds. But for today's, for purposes of today's talk, um, the uh, the Greenlight Bioscience Company is furthest along in terms of um, regulatory review of its product. It says here over in the far right column that it is expected to be uh, submitted to the EPA in 2020. Um, and uh, as far as we know, um, that, you know, that uh, application is um well advanced uh, in the EPA review, including uh, uh, in having EPA issue a uh, experimental use permit for field trials uh, for the green light uh, bioscience pesticide product. So <clears throat> generally speaking, I mean, there are, as I said, um, unintended uh, mutations may result in kind of benign traits. Um, however, there are also undesirable traits in these, um, in these unintended mutations, uh, including uh, lower germination rates uh, in the plant, uh, inappropriate plant height. The plants become so tall that they kind of bow over. It makes it more difficult for them to be harvested. Um, a lower plant density. Um, there are also changes in genetic composition resulting from the, uh, the gene silencing, and these can produce um, plant allergenicity. Um, so if the plant is you know, consumed directly, it can result in an aller, uh, allergenic uh, reaction uh, in the consumer. Uh, it can augment toxicity uh, in the plant. It can result in uh, nutritional deficiencies, according to uh, Dr. Ricard Steinbrecher. Um, there are undesirable traits that can be inherited from one generation of the plant to the next that are that result from large sequence alterations that change the plant structure. This is something that I, I don't quite claim, I don't claim to understand quite how it occurs, but obviously it's a very, um, it's a very serious concern. From the viewpoint of human health, um, uh, the inhalation of uh, RNA uh, interference molecules can reduce white blood cell count um, because of undesirable um, immune stimulation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, further on. So um, how do these RNA-based pesticide products uh, become uh, accepted by governments for commercial use. Well, in, um, in 2019, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development held a conference on RNA interference-based pesticides. And part of the purpose of these kind of conferences is for uh, industry scientists to meet with government regulators, government scientists, from the uh, 30 or so members, uh, member governments of the uh, OECD and to try to come to a consensus about, uh, about the science and about the regulatory framework. 
Um, the message from the uh, bio, green light bioscience uh, and the bear uh, crop science scientists to the OECD governments is one, um, there is a safe history of consumption of RNA in its natural state, which is, in my view, irrelevant to the consideration of, of um, RNA interference and not a basis for regulation. And then they concluded that there's very low risk from inhaling uh, RNA interference. And in my view, this is essentially uh, the silencing of the nanoscale inhalation risks. So well, first we need, we need to understand for this nanomaterial uh, pesticide delivery system um, that, that coats the RNA active ingredient, why do you need to have coating and what are the risks? So RNA uh, interference is unstable. It's easily destroyed uh, by, for example, by ultraviolet rays. It must have some kind of protective coating. And in this case, um, nanomaterials are used. Um, the, the nanomaterials that are used themselves are inert uh, and of very low risk. But um, because the nanoscaling is what enables uh, the RNA interference to penetrate uh, the plant, to move in the plant cell in a way that is impossible for macro scale pesticide droplets, in effect, the nanomaterials are what make the active ingredient more active uh, and more effective as uh, a neutralizer of pests or a killer of pests. So the, the beyond delivering uh, the RNA interference active ingredient to the targeted plants, it can also be delivered to any adjacent plant or animal with an RNA sequence that is similar to that of the targeted pest. And given you know, the extent of RNA uh, interference pesticide drift, that those adjacent plants or animals could be at quite a distance from the targeted field. Um, and this presents a major risk of inhalation harm because the lungs cannot expel a large fraction of nanoscale uh, RNA interference. There's been a lot of work done with other um, RNA, or excuse me, nanoscale particles, and the lungs were not able to uh, expel those nanoscale particles. Uh, therefore, um, it is likely that there is a chronic inhalation, chronic inhalation exposure to nano-enabled RNA pesticides, uh, for example, exposure um, to farm workers may result in immunity, uh, in immune suppression effects. So these uh, nanobio inhalation risks are generally known in the uh, scientific literature, but how they, where, where the nano, uh, nanoscale uh, particles go in the lungs for specific nanomaterials is not well understood. This is an example of one of those kind of articles where scientists are trying to predict um, the chronic inflammation uh, resulting from the inhalation of um, nanoscale particles, how these particles um, become anchored in the lower part of the, uh, of the lungs tissue and from there transport to uh, other organs in the body um, through the blood system. So why would green light biosciences and Bayer uh, dismiss or downplay these nano bio inhalation risks uh, at the OECD meeting? And, and this downplaying was not just done by them, but by other, um, uh, other scientists at this meeting who apparently did not really consider that uh, uh, that the nano pesticide delivery system posed any risk, apparently because the nanomaterials themselves uh, are, uh, are inert. So one reason they can dismiss or downplay these inhalation risks is that 
the EPA assesses risks only of the active ingredient and, and not the pesticide delivery system or the formulated pesticide. In, in other words, they are not risk assessing the actual product, but only this uh, active ingredient, which in the case of RNA interference cannot survive without the nanomaterial coating. So without the nanomaterial coating, the RNA interference molecule uh, is not an active ingredient. Uh, secondly, the, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, classifies uh, company studies and data as confidential business information. So um, for the most part, there's no public or peer reviewed of the company's safety claims for its products. Um, another reason for downplaying or dismissing risks is that the pesticide industry is desperately in need of new active ingredients to replace the active ingredients that are pest resistant and that are going off patent. Uh, the patent enables uh, their commercial monopoly and then the very widespread adoption uh, of these products because there are no alternatives that are presented in the market uh, and certainly not the, the governments are going to encourage the use of the products that they've approved rather than, for example, uh, agroecological approaches to pest management that would reduce uh, uh, pesticide use uh, dramatically. Um, another thing that, uh, another reason that they would dismiss or downplay the nanobioinhalation risks are simply that farm workers should wear, and this is a, a quote from the, um, the Greenlight Bioscience article um, and Bayer article that I cited, uh, they, they, they should wear the appropriate personal protective equipment. The problem being that presently there is no appropriate per personal protective equipment for uh, that, that is capable of detecting and, uh, and filtering out nanoscale pesticide particles. And last but certainly not least, there are billions of dollars uh, at stake, both in terms of crop loss, in terms of loss from uh, no longer having patents on their active uh, ingredients, and then just from the, the, the sales of the pesticide products. So here are some principles uh, for regulating uh, RNA interference pesticides. First, you should be risking risk assessing the entire product and not just the active ingredient. It, it's, it's scientifically, um, it, there's a lack of scientific integrity in uh, risk assessing only the active ingredient that cannot make, remain active without the nano coating. Um, secondly, don't base uh, genetically engineered pesticide, pes, pesticide regulation in irrelevant comparisons with the RNA as it occurs in nature and in humans you know, before it's engineered. Uh, don't classify co company studies and data relevant to environmental human health as confidential business information. Uh, confidential business information originally was uh, a clause basically designed to protect uh, trade secrets and it was used in customs uh, custom standard definitions. Um, now it seems to apply to about just about everything that a corporation does. Um, government scientists should be studying the nano bio interactions, the mutations in the non-target as well as targeted plants and animals. Um, if you restrict your uh, risk assessment study to only the targeted uh, plants and animals uh, or the target, in this case, the targeted uh, agricultural plants and not to all of the animals and plants that are adjacent to them, you are not going to have a complete uh, risk profile. And finally, do not follow um, the trade policy uh, edict which forbids risk assessing uh, the process of production in the regulation of the pesticide product. This is one of the most harmful uh, trade policies in terms of protecting uh, human and environmental health. But it is, unfortunately, um, the policy of the United States in the coordinated framework for the regulation of agricultural biotechnology. 
Now, talking a little bit about our uh, regulatory kind of postscript, what is what is currently at play uh, right now is that in uh, June of 2021, uh, Green Light Bioscience applied to the uh, Environmental Protection Agency for a pesticide experimental use permit uh, to um, to do field trials for its pesticide product. Um, in uh, 11 potato growing states, 200, 200 acres, um, and to uh, see how the pesticide uh, performed in kind of different growing conditions, um, somewhat different soils. And uh, the, the, the finish of these trials would then be in uh, April of 2023, following which um, EPA would presumably evaluate the results of these field trials, including the requirement that is lower down in this permit that uh, Greenlight Bioscience consider uh, the environmental justice impacts of the use of this pesticide product. And in our view, in the environmental justice requirement, uh, also it would, would include uh, impacts on the farm workers and uh, um, uh, pesticide uh, manufacturer workers producing this uh, pesticide product. However, uh, even you know, before it received this field trial permit, uh, Greenlight Bioscience was uh, advertising some field trials or results of field trials that, um, that we're not sure were conducted with an EPA experimental use permit uh, because it refers to uh, 100 field trials conducted over four years. Um, and uh, the claims are quite glowing um, for these uh, field trials. Um, and uh, it says here that our testing has shown that our Colorado be potato beetle product is safe for honeybees, butterflies, and several other non-target insects and mammals at use rates 100 times higher than our recommended rate. It degrades in soil and water within three days to benign natural nucleotides. So that this is, you know, from, a, from an environmental health perspective, uh, if the claims made here are, are valid, um, this is a uh, remarkable advance in uh, pesticide product design. However, uh, as we said, there, there is no uh, personal protective equipment for farm workers that is capable of sort of like a wearable biosensor to warn uh, farm workers when they were inhaling uh, too much of the uh, nanoscale pesticide particles and no um, respiratory equipment that would be uh, capable of filtering out those particles. Um, and here in also, uh, kind of coincidentally, in June of 2021, the National Institute for Occupational uh, Health and Safety uh, of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, put out a request for information on the needs and challenges in personal protective equipment for uh, use by underserved uh, user populations. So in our view, uh, farm workers, generally speaking, are among those um, underserved user populations. Uh, we have started to make contacts with, uh, with NIOSH, with the National Institute for Occupational uh, Health and Safety, about um, what they are doing in their technology uh, prototype workshop to develop this kind of nano biosensor and respiratory equipment. And those conversations will be ongoing. Fortunately, there's two years to develop uh, these, uh, this kind of equipment before uh, it will be possible for EPA to authorize commercial, uh, the commercial authorization for the uh, Greenlight Bio science pesticide product, um, the, the, the worker, the worker uh, protection standard for, for pesticide worker safety um, is supposed to um, 
apply to uh, more than 2 million uh, U.S. agricultural workers and pesticide handlers who are working in 600,000 agricultural establishments. And, uh, you know, we would argue that uh, to uh, implement this worker protection standard properly and to enforce it, um, that NIOSH would have to be working uh, cooperatively with uh, the Environmental Protection Agency to ensure that these 600,000 agricultural establishments uh, equipped their workers with affordable and wearable uh, personal protective equipment. One of the reasons to do so, of course, is to prevent pesticide poisonings. Now, this is a, um, uh, a pesticide action network a kind of um, press release about a peer-reviewed study uh, which analyzed um, acute pesticide poisonings from, uh, from hospital records and showing this dramatic increase uh, in pesticide poisonings um, from 25 million in 1990 to 385 million today, today being uh, uh, last year, excuse me, today being 2020. And, um, and so the, the, this does not uh, reflect uh, necessarily a corresponding increase among U.S. farm workers, uh, but still, you have, um, as you can see here, uh, these farm workers who are spraying pesticides with, um, I think maybe they have handkerchiefs on and gloves, and that is their personal protective equipment and obviously quite inadequate to, uh, uh, to protect them in field conditions, especially when uh, the pesticide is blowing back into their faces. So, uh, to conclude, um, the RNA interference nanopesticide delivery system and, and its active ingredient uh, pose human and environmental health risks. And um, the U.S. Environmental Agency will allow these risks if they authorize the commercial use of these pesticide products based on only an evaluation of the active ingredient isolated from the nano uh, the nano pesticide delivery system that is from the whole uh, pesticide product as it is bought and as it used as it is used. Um, there's an urgent need of course to reduce risks of immunity suppression in farm workers that are applying these um, RNA interference pesticide products. Therefore NIOSH uh, must develop adequate uh, personal protective equipment to prevent the inhalation of these nanoscale pesticide particles. And finally, EPA must require the use of such protective, personal protective equipment by farm workers and their employers under its agricultural worker protection standard. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, I'd also like to note that um, there is, there will be posted along with this lecture and the slide deck, uh, an article that develops in greater detail um, a lot of the information uh, presented here. This article was um, originally written uh, and translated into Portuguese for a, uh, an e-book for uh, advanced uh, undergraduates in technology policy in Brazil. And uh, now I'm kind of taking this article out uh, into the world and hoping that it will start a conversation about um, the regulation, the proper regulation risk assessment of um, these new RNA interference uh, uh, pesticide products that are enabled by uh, nano coatings and nanotechnology. So uh, with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. I do appreciate uh, any feedback um, on this, uh, on this presentation or on the corresponding article. Thank you so much. Goodbye.